we'd kind of left it off talking a little bit about the Inquisitions and how the Roman Catholic Church had started these Inquisitions with the Dominicans. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the source. Some sources say in the 1250s. It's all a matter of your reliability is based upon your source. So yeah. just, just assume that this Inquisition has been going on from the very beginning, as you suggested. It really begins with uh, Saul of Tarsus. That's where the Inquisition started. He was a Roman citizen. He was also a Pharisee. He was a Jewish citizen. He was working both sides of the fence, and nothing really has changed. He was the model of the Inquisition and went out slaughtering Christians in the name of God, thinking he was doing the service of God. Well, all along he was in the service of Lucifer. And when he got saved and fell off his donkey and had this incredible salvation experience, it just flipped him over into an entirely different person. And that Inquisition didn't end. It just carried on. Rome carried on. There was a brief reprieve around 300 AD in that period of time with Constantine. But there's a lot of debate about when did the rule of the popes begin. Different historians start as early as 400 and some say 800. It was a gradual thing, and I think that's the whole issue. And the Inquisitions never really stopped. They briefly stopped during Constantine's rule, but not in the outlying provinces. In provinces where they were still practicing paganism and different religions, the persecution still continued, and he, in fact, had to send out some edicts to tell them to shut it down, or he would be sending some armies out to straighten them out. So it never really ever went away. And when we get into what is really considered the Spanish Inquisition, I suppose, I I think Charles Buck talks about that in his dictionary, that it was to deal with the Waldenses primarily. But it was the Dominicans, right, that were behind that. And they mercilessly slaughtered Christians. And my understanding of it is it had everything to do with the Word of God because these pockets of real Christians... They had the real Word of God. They had the texts. They knew what the Word of God was, and Rome didn't want them to have that because that was what kept them informed, and they knew who Antichrist was. But Rome wanted to destroy those manuscripts and destroy those people. They had a terrible time trying to expunge the Word of God, and the Inquisitions went on and on until the Protestant Reformation. Then it got handed over to the Jesuits, And the Jesuits soon realized that the more they persecuted people, the more it spread the gospel. Yeah, it's really hard to add to what you just said. That pretty much covers it very concisely, and that is the Inquisition has always gone on. However, there is an organized force to eliminate what they call heresy. And heresy is anything that is against the purpose of, we'll call it the Holy Roman Empire or the papacy. And they have an organized effort between the Jesuits, Dominicans, and they're called other names in other countries, such as the Black Friars in England. But nevertheless, there is a nonstop effort to get rid of the Word of God and replace it with papal doctrine. That's really what it comes down to. Yes, and one of the myths that the Roman Catholic Church has perpetrated is that the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, was to canonize the Bible, the Word of God. And it wasn't for that purpose at all. The true believers had the Word of God. They had the New Testament letters. There was no question about what belonged in the canon and what didn't belong in it. When 325 rolled around, that was all about getting Arius's doctrines on the table and saying, no, this idea that you have, Mr. Arius, doesn't fit with the letters that we already have. It had nothing to do with canonizing the Scripture. They already had it, and in fact, in 90 AD, Marcion, I believe, published a critique of the letters of the New Testament, and I believe he mentioned most of them in that critique, and he was very negative toward the Jewish people at the time. So we know that those letters were in circulation. We know the real believers had them. We know that they had them after the Nicene Council, and we know that that was what the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Piedmontese, the Huguenots, they all had the Bible. It never disappeared. But Rome wants you to believe that it was Constantine who put it all together, and then they want to take credit. Well, we brought you the Bible. We canonized the Bible, which is complete nonsense. 
All of those counsels to do with Nicaea before and after was all about false doctrines. And Arius was basically the same as a Jehovah's Witness for all intents and purposes. And they knew at that time that those teachings did not fit with the letters that they had. So what Constantine did was said, well, I'm going to commission that we compile all of this stuff into one big book. And he had 50 of those printed, allegedly, and distributed them through the empire. The church has always had the word of God, John, and that's the point I'm trying to make. And no matter how much Rome has tried to suppress it, it always is somewhere. Correct. God's word is always somewhere. And now that was a major theme in the film that I produced, A Lamp in the Dark, that in the world there's always you know, a flicker of light. The word of God is always shining in spite of the severe persecution. But you have to seek God out. And we also went into Constantine around the time of the Council of Nicaea was, was a segment in the film A Lamp in the Dark where we talked about this. We talked about Constantine merging the so-called Christianity with the pagans and coming up with this hybrid, which is really Roman Catholicism, where you've got a paganized Christianity and at the same time they're rewriting the Bible and less than 100 years Later, after the Council of Nicaea, you've got Jerome rewriting the Bible in Latin for the Catholic Church against his will. He was not happy to do that because he knew that they were going to corrupt the Word, and they did make changes. They took the Hebrew and the Greek, they translated it into Latin, but they made changes to it, and Jerome was not happy about this. That's an output of the Council of Nicaea. One of the things about Constantine is there's a lot of debate about whether he really did have a conversion experience, and I don't know if he did or he didn't, and I don't really care because there's no way to really, really prove whether he did or he didn't or whether his visions were real. But the fact of the matter is he did see the Christian movement, so to speak, as a way to consolidate the empire. And he issued a decree that said, okay, you folks down in the catacombs that have been refusing to submit to Caesar as the authority over all religions, come on out of the catacombs. He gave them land. He gave them churches. It was, they were old pagan temples and things like that. He financed the church, and they took the bait for the most part. Not everybody took it, but a majority came out because they were tired of living that way, and they became that foundation upon which Constantine began to build the state church. And it's no different today. The state still sponsors the church, whether it's Protestant churches or Roman Catholic churches. It doesn't really matter. Without the sponsorship of the state, you don't have a church. And 99% of them today in North America are chattels of the state, so to speak. They're corporations of the state. And that goes back to Constantine. And this was a brilliant strategy, John, because he saw which way the tide was going. And then what he did was he began incorporating all the pagan statues. It didn't happen just in his lifetime, but it happened over a period of time where all of a sudden statues of Jupiter became, oh, that's Peter. Statues of Isis, statues of Venus, statues of Tammuz and the goddess and child figure, those became the Virgin Mary. And so all of this got rolled into this one organization, which became Papal Rome. It became the Antichrist religion that came out of Christianity, so to speak, that John speaks of when he said, Antichrist went out from us. They were not of us, right? Correct. And really the theme here is, when you mix economics and economic incentives with religion, you wind up running into problems 100% of the time. And what Constantine did really is going on today in modern times and has happened throughout history where you get the Vatican making treaties, concordates with governments, with countries, and you have a quid pro quo going on. They get economic concessions in exchange for other things. And it's just a deadly combination when your religion is commingled with financial incentives. The true church of the New Testament, the one described by Jesus, described by Paul and other writers of the New Testament, that church seeks no legal status seeks no indemnification against any legal issue, seeks no approval, seeks no sanction, issues no legal dictums, 
makes no law cases, makes no suits, has a total independence from everything that is institutional and governmental, yet it is not at enmity with legal and lawful and just government, but it is not seeking any kind of justification. It cannot be sued. It does not sue. It has nothing to do with this world system. And when we look at the church today and the church that Constantine started, it was all about bringing it under what they referred to as religio licita, which is licit religion, legal religion. And that is sanctioned by the state. To get back to that church that is not sanctioned by the state is very difficult. I can't find any churches like that in my area. They're all corporations of the state. They all want to build bigger buildings. They all want more social programs. They all want better entertainment. They want better, 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 and they want to send the pastor off on a cruise every year. (laughs) I don't want any part of that, John. Yeah, that's really not Christianity, and anyone that has read and believed on the true Word of God can see right through that. You captured it perfectly when you said the Christian church is not set up to be an economically incentivized entity. It is for the purpose of spreading the gospel so that people who believe can receive the Holy Spirit. That's pretty much it. Everything else is just kind of window dressing, so to speak. And that's a fact. And Satan, as you said in the Bible says, was created more subtle than any beast of the field. The intellectual capacity of Satan and his ability to deceive and act subtly is really beyond our comprehension, except for the power of the Holy Ghost showing us what's going on. We, too, would totally be sucked into that whole mess. And yet, he has seen the institutional church since the day of Constantine as a major force to promote his doctrines. And the whole idea of trying to kill the Word of God... It's always been the objective of Antichrist Church. Today, I was studying the preface material to the UBS Greek New Testament. Now, there's a number of them. I think this is the UBS 4. But they also discuss the previous editions. Every single edition had Roman Catholics on the board of translations. And they talk about Tischendorf and praise Tischendorf. They praise Westcott and Hort. They praise the Nesselalund. They clearly established that lineage to the false Alexandrian manuscripts, and they shamelessly tell you that, and the average pastor and the average person sitting in the pews will never pick up that Greek New Testament and read the preface and go, the Bible I'm reading comes from these guys? So there's got to be something wrong here. What's really disturbing is that <clears throat> through my research and, and studies, you get quite the embrace of these Alexandrian Egyptian manuscripts by a lot of these so-called Christian leaders, such as John Rice of Sword of the Lord, he praised the Pope's manuscripts, you know, as did C.I. Schofield, even Bob Jones of Bob Jones University, they promote the Alexandrian manuscripts at their university by selling the New American Standard Bible. And people that are Christians need to understand this, that your most popular and trusted Christian leaders are often your worst enemies. They're supporting the Pope. And that's the danger of the Roman Catholic Church, is some of the most powerful Roman Catholics come to you as your most beloved Christian leaders, that, as Jesus Christ says, his ministers, Satan's ministers, are as ministers of righteousness. In current times, since the Lateran Treaty, you've got Adolf Hitler, who was a Catholic, who was hanging out with the Cardinals during World War II, and he was also an occultist. And I think pretty obviously possessed by devils. And people need to know that Hitler was ultimately subject to the Vatican and their powers. And there's plenty of information on that. You go further in time after the Lateran Treaty of 1929 and after World War II, you come up to the early 1980s where Ronald Reagan is now cooperating with Pope John Paul II and they're revitalizing relations between the United States and the Vatican. What purpose does that have? Why are we commingling our government with a religion over in Europe? There's really no point to it. There's nothing in it for the United States. But Reagan, as we talked about in our last interview, was surrounded by Catholics, and in fact, his own dad was a Roman Catholic. So Ronald Reagan, professing 
I can tell you how that works, John, and I'm sure you know this. The Vatican, the papacy, has always worked in concert with governments. And during the Inquisitions, it was the civil authorities that carried out the executions, the tortures, the murders, for the most part, and the burnings. Because the Vatican said, we're not doing this. These people are handed over to the civil authorities. But they don't tell people that the civil authorities were all Roman Catholics under their control. And this is exactly why Rome, of course, would want to concord at with the United States of America, so that it could use the United States of America as an arm of its inquisitions and then stand back in the wings and say, well, we're just a bunch of simple priests and we're a religious organization. We don't have anything to do with wars and crimes against humanity and bombing poor innocent people in third world countries in Iraq and Iran. We don't have anything to do with that. When in fact they do, they have everything to do with it. And that brings me back to the point you made about Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, yes, he was sanctioned by the Roman Catholic Church. He was financed by the Roman Catholic Church. When he started negotiating with the Roman Catholic Church, they signed a concordat, and I've read large portions of that concordat. It's been translated into English. And he gave them authority over the education system in Germany, and he gave them the status of the official religion of the Nazi Empire, of the Third Reich. So they had both the religion and the education sewn up. In exchange for that, Adolf Hitler got all the financing and backing that he wanted. And you look through the internet, you can find hundreds of photos of the Roman Catholic Church cozying up with Adolf Hitler and saluting him and partying with him and all this kind of stuff. And there's no question about that. And they openly admit that they, in fact, signed this concordat. And that concordat, you can read it if you want. Most people don't, but if you read it, then there's no question in your mind that Hitler and the Vatican colluded, and that was part of the Inquisition. And they didn't just go after Jews, they went after anybody who was against them, but the primary target was the Jews because there was an economic advantage, and the Vatican is very greedy, and so was Adolf Hitler, and they had to finance this whole thing, and then all of those spoils went through the, the rat lines into the Vatican. There is an incredible amount of Nazi treasure in the Vatican and in other places. And of course, when I took history in high school and even in college, uh, I didn't quite learn it that way that you <laughs> described. That was left out. But of course, if you look at publishing and education, they've got control over that as well. So of course, you'll never really get that type of truth through uh, your secular education. Why don't we talk about the Hegelian dialectic and how it relates to the Word of God? That is a most fascinating subject, and I believe Hegelian dialectic is a foundational strategy of Lucifer, and it is the foundation of everything that the Jesuits do. Yes, and you've got the thesis. You can even say, okay, the Word of God, which is eternal, is the thesis. That's the standard that everyone must live by, every word. And then you've got the antithesis, which is a complete counter to the Word of God done in a somewhat clever and subtle way. And then you've got the synthesis, the compromise. And so there's a lot to talk about there because you and I have read the 1611 Bible. We know what the Word of God is, but if you can keep people from that knowledge, then you can reach a compromise or a synthesis with relative ease. And that's what's happened today with all these modern Bibles. Yeah, the modern Bibles control the very thing you've said. It's the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. So when you pick up a modern Bible, you could flip through there and you could find the stuff that you want to find. You can find the stuff that you think is right. And you can find the core doctrines. You can find your Baptist confession. You can buy, find your Westminster confession in there and go, oh, well, this Bible must be okay. But if you dig deeper, you will find the antithesis of that. And it'll contradict itself all over the place. You and I have been through these modern translations. We know where it demotes Christ. We know where it makes Jesus a sinner. We know where it makes Jesus unclean in some of the new Bibles where it says his family went for purification. It includes Jesus in the family, whereas it was Mary's purification because she was in her menstrual cycle, and that's what that was about. But they take that out of there, so now Jesus is impure. 
yet you'll find the doctrine that says Jesus is God. You'll find that also. Then you'll find that synthesis, which is the Gnosticism of the Catholic Church. And that's the Alexandrian manuscripts. It's the Gnosticism where Lucifer and Jesus become equal. They are aspects of the same person or two different people of equal essence. Yes, and anyone familiar with the true Word of God that has read it and believed on it and has had an opportunity to also read, like I have, the Jesuit Reims Bible of 1610 with all of their, I will call, hate-filled commentary towards the Christians, such as Luther and anyone opposing the Pope, you will see that their Bible is wildly different from the Christian Bible, and they admit that Christians consider the Pope the Antichrist. They admit that in their Bible, and they change countless words, and they also teach that you can pay money to get your sins forgiven. And then that leads up to the modern day, where you've got the modern Bibles that, such as the NIV, for example, or the New American Standard, they don't contain the books of the Apocrypha, or the second canon of Scripture, as the Catholic Church defines it. But they do contain many of the changes and corruptions that Rome made to the text. And what it leaves people with is a dumbed-down version of the Gospel that has some core doctrines, like we know that there's Jesus, we know that there's Mary, we know that there's Joseph, but all the prophecy is erased, and people don't know it's a Catholic Bible. And it doesn't say, let's go out and call Protestant heretics. They got all that out of it, but it is a compromise between the Word of God and the Jesuit Reims Bible, the two polar extremes. Modern Bibles are a compromise, a hybrid between the two, and designed as a bridge to pacify people and give them something that they can feel good with, instead of God's fierce rebukes about who the poor of Babylon is and who the Antichrist is and all the prophecies. You'll find none of that in modern Bibles. So that's a perfect example of how that has been implemented with subtlety in order to reach their agenda. You know what I find fascinating? I've read through pretty much all of the Roman Catholic Catechism, the one promulgated by John Paul II, I forget what year that was done. They upgrade it every so often, but it's as good as any other. And in that Catholic catechism, I can find you the Protestant doctrines of salvation by faith and faith alone. That is stated clearly in the Roman Catholic catechism. The problem is it is then qualified in other places to mean in the context of the Roman Catholic Church that is true. They'll say faith includes your work. So you have to do works, your fleshly deeds, in order to show your faith. Yeah. It has nothing to do with believing on the pure Word of God and receiving the Holy Spirit and then being directed by the Holy Spirit. It has to do with your ability to show your faith through your good works. Voluntary oath of poverty or whatever the priests and nuns take, that type of thing, an outward show. None of it fools God. None of it's biblical. The aspect of this Hegelian dialectic comes in when they say, oh yes, salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone, but it's only through the Roman Catholic Church. If you're not part of the Roman Catholic Church and under the authority of the Pope, God's visible representation, his vicar on earth, then you can't have that faith alone. You see? Exactly. And that's how Hegelian dialectic works. So they give you the Protestant doctrine, but then they requalify it. They will say that everybody's a sinner, and nobody can go to heaven except through Jesus Christ. But if my memory serves me on page 256, it says that Mary was sinless. Mary was born sinless. Yet the Bible says that Mary called out to God and said, My Savior unto Jesus. Right, and she was under law of Moses, and she had to offer, I think, two turtle doves to atone during her purification in an atonement for her uncleanliness or her sin. Exactly. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this is the nature of that Hegelian dialectic that you raised a little bit earlier, is they're giving you the truth, all have sinned. They state that, no question about it. But then they make Mary sinless despite the fact that the scripture, as you pointed out, she had to offer turtle doves because of her uncleanness. This is the same thing as saying, I'm a sinner. And she acknowledged that. 
And Mary would, if I can use the expression, roll over in her grave, so to speak, if she heard what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching of her. Oh, exactly. Because I think the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is something that's been developed in the last couple hundred years. Yeah. I think if you go back farther than that, you won't find it as much. The emphasis on Mary being born without sin came about sometime in the 1800s, if I remember correctly. That's when it became official. It was codified, yeah. but there was smatterings of it up through the centuries, and there's always been sort of cultic offshoots within Roman Catholicism. And Rome tolerates all kinds of cultic stuff, Santeria and all kinds of things. They don't really care too much about that as long as you're under the authority of the church. That's what they care about. Well, exactly, and I can speak to that from my own personal experience. I was raised in a Catholic family, and you just submit to the teachings of your priest who are getting their orders from the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and you figure everything is fine if you just listen and go to Mass once a week and go to confession every once in a while. You never really think that there's any problem. I never had any idea that I was born judged already and condemned already by God and that I had to be born again, not by getting sprinkled on the forehead, but by believing the testimony of Jesus that many corrupt and hardly anyone has faith in, according to Jesus. So that was powerful for me is because I wasn't raised to really be concerned about anything to do with the Bible. Pretty much by the time I was 18, I was like a lot of Catholics, very apathetic. Not sure what to believe, but sure, you just go to Mass and everything's fine. And hey, I'm born into the Catholic Church, therefore I've got a free ticket to heaven. That's the message. If you're born in, and as a child you're baptized into the Church, that's a done deal. You're confirmed when you're 11 or 12 years old. That's all sealed up, and away you go. Go forth, wreak havoc, rape, pillage, plunder, but make sure you come back to confession and make sure you pay money and this sort of thing and everything everything's fine and you've got your ticket and you've got your absolution. It's not much different today in most of the Protestant churches, John. The whole idea of generational Christianity, it's huge in America. I talk to people all the time and they all say they're Christians and I know they're not, but they think they're Christians because they go to a Christian church. Their mother and father were Christian. They know nothing about the Bible. They know nothing about the Word of God. And if they do know anything, it's all from the corrupt Bibles and listening to guys like John MacArthur and Benny Hinn and all this junk that comes out of TBN. They have no personal relationship with the Word of God because they don't have it. If you're not looking into the 1611 King James Bible and relating to that directly, you don't have a personal relationship with the Word of God. And we have to remember, God said that He would magnify His Word above His name. That is a powerful statement. What is God trying to tell us? How important is this Word of His? Much more important than His name, according to Him. But these cultural Christians have no relationship to that. And Jesus Christ talks about this in His Word. He talks about the Babylonian harlot church has her harlot daughters that go whoring after other gods, that because of many corrupting the word of God, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, there's a lack of faith on earth, and Jesus Christ questions when he returns, will he even find faith? And the only way to find that is through his word, in a belief in his word, not just, oh, I use the word. And so the world is really in a very desperate, desolate state, according to the word of God, and that is in wild contrast to what we would believe by just turning on the television or listening to the radio or going to the church and listening to the pastor, because all roads lead to Rome. The pastors, if they come out of a seminary, have been brainwashed by the Jesuits, no exception. The only way to be a pastor is to receive the Holy Spirit and be directed by God. You have to be a man of faith. You have to get your doctrine from the Holy Spirit on the true Word of God and he will lead you to all truth, and you can edify others and fellowship with others that have that same faith and experience. You don't go and learn in a classroom about Jesus, because that's just a setup for failure. Yes, I agree with that completely, and that's one of the primary reasons we started doing these conversations, these interviews, is to direct people to the 1611 King James Bible and teach them the truth about it. To wake up and go, my goodness, I get it. I see what's happening. And, of course, we're going to continue to do studies as we go through the Bible and look at 
some of the punctuations and the capitalizations, or we could look at punctuations in the corrupt Bibles, even the Blaney 1769, where the punctuations are changed to alter really important ideas, important lessons that we can't get if the punctuation is moved, if a comma is taken out or a capital is taken out. So that's something we want to spend more time on. And the other thing, too, you and I have talked about is testimonies. The testimonies of two people that you sent me that really moved me were the testimonies of Garth and David. And at some point in time, I really want to talk about that because this is all about changed lives and what changed their lives and the fact that these people who changed had a radical about face, just like Saul of Tarsus who fell off his donkey and all of a sudden is a new man, completely different, not accepted in the circles that he traveled in, and he knew why things were the way they were. There was no question in his mind. And you talked about these two men. One of them is your brother, and the other was a fellow in, um, I think, California somewhere who came out of the sex trade and has a tremendous testimony. And who knows, at some point in time, it'd be great to have them on the line and let them share their testimonies in person if they would do that. I look forward to that because that's really why we're doing this, Reg. It's the power of the Word of God to change people. It's a spiritual conversion that is the engine is God's Word, and He does the work. Jesus Christ performs the operation. When you get saved, He rebukes you, you're chastened, and then you're received. If you can endure the chastening, He receives you as a son. And in the case of my brother and of this other guy named Garth, I mean, these guys were lost, almost completely hopeless. And what God did in reaching out to them and the power of Jesus Christ and the Word of God and putting that conviction in them was nothing short of amazing, but it is exactly what people in this world need to be saved and understand the power of the Word to change people now and to change your future for an eternity. That's the whole purpose of everything we're doing. John, we have one obvious task that's been laid before us, and that is to educate. I believe you and I have been called to do that, to bring this information forward, to inform the church, to teach the church. But above and beyond that is the Great Commission, which overrides everything. The reason we're teaching the church is hopefully some of them caught up in that mess will get saved because there's a lot of people in the institutional church system. They're not saved, John. They go through all the motions, they believe all the doctrines, and they're not saved. Exactly. I believe that completely. Reg, I don't think that I've met too many saved people, and I hate to say that, but when somebody comes into my church or comes in and tells me they're a Christian, I just have a conversation with them and over time judge them. I do by the Word of God, by what comes out of their mouths, because Jesus tells me by their fruits ye shall know them. And, you know, I don't give them a big hard quiz or anything, but I've come to the personal conviction that there's very few people that are truly saved, because when you're truly saved, You've got the power of the Holy Spirit in you, and you can get a supernatural discernment of things and a conviction that you can't get if you're just a natural person. And God gives different spiritual gifts to different people, but we should all be with one accord on what the Word of God says, and I find that to be very difficult to find people that have that conviction. Yes, and I hear what you're saying. When I talk to people, I'm very slow to come to any judgment about what I think about whether or not somebody's saved or not, because anybody who's been schooled up in even the most basic church can answer the questions correctly. Do you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Check. Do you believe Jesus was born of a virgin? Check. Do you believe salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ? Check. And and down the list. And they'll all check everything off correctly. And that is no indication of salvation. Jesus made it clear when the thief on the cross turned to him and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. There was no contrived kind of relationship. God knows the heart. He knows what's going on. And he's the one who determines who's saved and who's not. Not me. I don't know. That is correct. I just tend to use my spiritual insights. The Word does say, a stranger's voice will they not hear. And I realize that if someone is in a spirit of slumber, they could be saved and not have the discernment because God has shut their eyes until he wants to wake them up. It says that in Matthew 25. But at the same time, if somebody is actively being taught by the Holy Spirit, there is real power in the Word, and there's real power in the Holy Spirit. And 
I meet people who have that conviction who may be off track a little bit, but when you start telling them the truth, hey, this is what this word should be, or this is what the word of God is, they get a conviction. They have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And those are the people that I feel convicted that are saved through the Holy Spirit, not the people that are full of themselves. The people in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, they were believers, and they heard the word and received it with joy. And guess what? None of them got saved until I believe it was Peter and John came and laid hands on them. And God taught us a lesson that you can hear the word and believe, but you've got to really believe what God's word is saying and not put your confidence in men like Simon the Sorcerer or right. this modern day televangelist or, or this guy, this professor or this pastor or, or this guy. You've got to receive the Holy Spirit to be saved. Once you have the Holy Spirit, he will lead you to all truth, and you can find a church through prayer and edify one another, and God will direct your paths. And John, you and I are just the messengers. We bring the information forward. We're not the only messengers, but we are messengers. We bring the information forward, and our objective is that people not become dependent upon us, but that they get saved They're now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They now have the real written word of God in their hand. And guess what? They don't need us. They don't need to listen to you and me because they now have the Holy Spirit teaching them in all truth. They have the word of God. Our objective is to make people independent of the system, and we don't want to become the system ourselves. Yes, exactly. I mean, that is the objective. God does the work. God does the teaching. God gives the spiritual gifts, and all we want to do is point people to what the true word is and tell them, look, you have to have faith. You have to believe in your heart the word of God, and you have to be able to confess Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, not the precepts of men. Once you do that, then God will use you to go ahead and reach out to others. So it's a snowball effect. That's really how the gospel is spread. I don't want anybody listening to me. That's too much responsibility long term. I just want people to understand that you and I both know what the word is and what the word is not. And that's the message that we want to get out to everyone. Yes, we are basically enemies of the pastor pope, so to speak. We're bad for that kind of business because the pastor pope wants you dependent upon him, whether it's the Catholic Church or your Protestant or Baptist Church. The pastor wants you to think he knows and you don't know. If you're not saved, that's the case. But if you're saved, you can see through everything that guy is teaching. Yes, and they're financially incentivized. These guys, almost all of them, have, you know, salaries that they're paying themselves and, you know, they get paid. And and I understand that there's a certain point where that seems to be okay. But the problem is, is when you become a professional pastor and money is part of your motivation, then what Jesus are you going to be preaching long term? Because the rock of offense turns people away from church. It's happened to my church. I've had so many people walk out of my church. I give sober sermons. I'm not a yeller or a screamer during sermons. I just give people the truth. And the people that go to church, they love hearing the truth. But every once in a while, somebody comes in and they say, it's so wildly different from the next church. I just can't be here. And that's true Christianity. You either embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior, or he is a rock of offense that will turn you away. There is no in-between. There's no gray area. John, I think we should leave it at that. So let's close the conversation off right now. And you know what I'd like to think about, perhaps for next time around, is conspiracy. Because that's another tactic of the devil, the Jesuits. Anything that brings accusation against them with evidence is called conspiracy today. And that word means a lot to me because I went through that making the films, as I will tell you. I was accused of being a conspiracy theorist making these films. Yeah. Have you ever heard anybody accuse anybody of being a conspiracy factualist? Never. Only the one side of the equation. Yet the word conspiracy comes up at least ten times in the Bible. Talks about conspiracy directly. And the number of conspiracy stories in the Bible are in the dozens and dozens. They don't use the word conspiracy, but you can list them right back from Satan deceiving Eve and Jezebel stealing Naboth's vineyard and all these conspiracies. The devil is full of conspiracy. 
And the Jesuits have managed to create this idea that if you bring an accusation against them with all the evidence in the world and they call you a conspiracy theorist, that's an argument and you're done. Yeah. Anybody that's read the Word of God knows that cover to cover, you've got ongoing fallen people conspiring to undermine the true Christian faith. So it's a continuous process throughout the Word of God where man fails over and over and over, but God's there and has mercy on those that put their trust in Him. Conspiracy underlies all sin. It's always a, an effort to do yeah. something to circumvent the gospel, to circumvent the word of God, to circumvent that which is good and righteous, and do something wicked and make it appear like it's not. Amen.